take responsibility for your life. Achieve fulfillment with recovery. Check out responsiblerecovery.net. Hello to all suffering addicts and hello to all the people who have found sanity in the recovery lifestyle. In this episode of Stories of Addiction, I will be talking to Marty about his addiction and his recovery from addiction. Marty is a client at the Galt House Sober Living Environment in Santa Cruz, California. He is 31 years old, and he has been addicted to heroin and benzos, amongst other things. How are you doing today, Marty? I'm doing great. Yeah, well, welcome, and thank you for uh, thank you for coming tonight. Um, sure thing. Why don't you tell us how your addiction got started? My addiction got started. Um, I was a late bloomer, so my addiction got started kind of very naively. Um, you know, first year of college, um, you know, kind of heard things, you know, through the grapevine of about like Vicodin and you know, in rap songs and Eminem songs and kind of just always heard about it, but it was very naive because I didn't, I mean, my sister had issues, but not with like hard drugs. Um, so I never had kind of been face to face or knew anybody personally that had, um, had went, you know, went through that, that journey of addiction and the, the ups and downs and, you know, main, mainly just downs. But, um, but, uh, so I, I think I was, if there was a first moment, I think I was bouncing at a um, a venue out by my college. I was going to a zoo specific down in Southern California at the time, and um, one of the bouncers like had Vicodin and you know offered it up. And of course, me and my buddies were you know we were down because we didn't know you know all we all we thought was there was just, it was just you know good things about it so i think it was the first time i took it and of course because it was the first time yeah it was i mean you have some of the negative things that happen with just you know the way you feel from the actual drug but um that was the first time i think i experienced it and it was mainly just you know good feelings of euphoria plus you know i'm sure we'll get into later but the things i had gone through recently at that point kind of made me more willing and to kind of go down that path or kind of go you know experiment i guess what do you you want to expound on that a little bit? Like what what you had gone through recently? Well, I just had had a a, a bone marrow transplant. I had just had hot, just had a, a bout of um, I had you know the c word it sounds hardcore with cancer or whatever, but I had Hodgkin's lymphoma, and so I just had a bone marrow transplant, and you know that was the second time I'd gotten sick, and you know at that point I was old enough to for at least as much as you can at that at that age seventeen. Um, to be kind of like, you know, screw the world and, and, um, you know, uh, I hadn't, you know, I'd been super clean cut up until that point. And so if, you know, now this is what happens when I do that. So now I'm, you know, if I was ever going to be open to experimenting just by the nature of, you know, growing up and being in that young college age, I was even more so, you know, I was, it was amplified times a million because I just didn't care and, you know, I was just kind of the, the, the cuffs were off and I was just going to, you know, go not hold back and not say really, not say no to anything essentially. So that's where I was at. So that's why I was, I say I was, not only was I naive, but it was amplified because of what I had just gone through. And, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I was looking, for, I wasn't necessarily looking for any sort of escape, but I mean, you know, I was, uh, in hindsight, I was definitely, you know, susceptible and kind of waiting for that first thing that would take me out of my head. So that's kind of a short way. It almost almost sounds like a kind of duality between like a like a nihilistic pursuit of it on one hand, but also like, and I'm grateful to be alive. You know, I'm just going to live it up, sort of approach. Yeah, you know? it, exactly. In the, in the duality the nihilistic part for sure. But then the second part, the other, the flip side to that would be not necessarily, I'm glad to be alive, but you know, the statistics that they have to give you, you know, about, Hey, this is your, your chance of making it to this age. This is your chance of making it to that age. And because I had to had it twice, those things actually, ma those things actually meant something at this point. You know, the first time I got sick, I, you know, I don't know, I was a little bit younger too, but it, those things necessarily wouldn't have mattered to me because a lot of it has to do with, you know, if you get, if the, you have a relapse and we're talking medical relapse. Um, 
So once I had that, then the statistics really do matter because it's all about that relapse. And so it was like, a, you know, you're not going to, I'm not going to make it to this age. I'm not going to make it to that age. So I'm absolutely going to go balls to the wall, you know, in, in, in my own kind of way. Um, had you been exposed to opiates um, through your uh, cancer diagnosis? Yes. Um, not, I didn't get anything prescribed, but times where they took the bone marrow out, times where they put the, um, the catheter in, um, one of my catheters in, um, I did get things I, I think, uh, I know because I just, I guess I was always ready to be that kind of guy, um, that was really, you know, into the details of those kind of things, really interested in what makes this happen. Why do I feel this way? You know, what are things that are like that? So I think, you know, I know I got things not, not a lot. I think the only thing I got, you know, somewhat frequently, and I didn't really even care at the time was like out of van. Um, but those few times that sent me to a whole nother world were like, uh, you know, it was a combination of Dilaudid and Versed, um, you know, some Demerol, uh, things like that. And I joked about it with the nurses and that was kind of the running joke while I was in the hospital. Um, or running joke, yeah, that I would make comments about the things that I was getting. I mean, the main thing I got all the time and at the time would really kind of mess me up was the Benadryl. And, you know, you got to keep in mind I was getting, I had getting it through my catheter that was going like straight to whatever my carotid or whatever, you know, right to my heart without any tolerance to any drugs at the time. That that would literally, in hindsight, comparing how that made me, how, how that messed me up to other things in the future that thing at the time messed me up probably more than anything ever did in the future so every time it was a joke oh here comes the benadryl oh, good night mom or you know or and so yeah so that kind of developed a thing with the, the nurses and the doctors who even though i had never touched any drugs or anything like that kind of thought oh this guy's susceptible you know be careful and um so yeah so a few times i got some pretty hardcore things um but but mainly the only thing i really got was out of in Hmm. So, so let's go back to, um, to what you said about uh, the first time you, you kind of abused, you got the Vicodin from your, mm -hmm. uh, was it a bouncer friend? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I didn't really know the guy. I just knew him from that, you know, venue or whatever, but yeah, it was just like some, some huge, you know, monster Sasquatch guy that I'm sure that even probably helped too. Like, Oh, look at this cool guy, this huge dude with all these tattoos and, you know, but I mean, yeah. So yeah, it was it was some random dude. So what what happened after getting the Vicodin that first time? Uh, I think the first time, it just you you get that you know you get the the, the fuzzy warm kind of um, you lose your that thing that inside all humans that makes you kind of worry or you know uh, um, you know uh, the thing that make you know the thing that makes you just care about things kind of goes away and you still care but it's completely fabricated it's a complete kind of just chemical care you know you just you know everything's great and this and that and there's just no room for any sort of worry and nothing sticks even if somebody would were to mention something that was bothering you five minutes ago before you started being high it just it comes in and it comes right out you know it nothing nothing bad sticks because you're just on this you know this cloud and, um, you know, at the same time that I was doing that, if I look back at something I just remembered, because I, I, as I said, the thing that I got a lot in the, in the hospital that I didn't even really realize it, I almost didn't realize it in hindsight, I didn't realize it at all, was the Ativan. They gave me that out of the hospital, like a bottle of that. And, um, you know, I remember sitting in my dorm room. This is the, you know, this was almost the more of the, the, the first of everything sitting in my dorm room that freshman year and I had developed or I got a panic attack and I didn't know what that was. I know now what it was, but I didn't know at the time and it wasn't, I wasn't thinking about anything. It wasn't, you know, uh, something bothering me and I'm panicking. It was just a physical, you know, my heart started racing and things like that. And, um, you know, when I called the nurse, I had a nurse at the time that I could call. Um, they said, Oh, here, that's why we gave you that stuff, that Ativan stuff. And, I almost immediately, I feel like, you know, like I probably took it normal a few times and this is with never doing drugs or, it happened, you know, I didn't really wasn't, I didn't drink other, more so than any other high school kid who drank. Um, but pretty quickly I started like, oh, I'm going to take two this time, 
you know, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take two. And, and I fought off, you know, the guys in, in my dorm, in my dorm, um, you know, that were smoking weed or this or that. I had still never smoked weed up, you know, I'm 18 at this point, but I think after the first or after like the first semester or pretty close to, you know, a few months after saying no, like I'm not, it's not me. It's not me. I started smoking weed. So that combined with me, the Ativan, what I would do is I would start taking a, a, a few too many Ativan and smoke and isolate. Um, so that was kind of going on in the background of when I would take these Vicodin. So I had a little bit of experience of, you know, kind of like, um, shit, excuse my language. Um, um, you know, they gave me all this medicine in the hospital, you know, why can't I just take whatever I want, you know, to make my, to self medicate myself now, you know, it was, if it was okay for them, it should be okay for me. And that was kind of a, you know, an, an F you kind of way of thinking. I wasn't really like a thought out, you know, Oh, like this is what I'm going to, it's more like, you know, Hey, you guys gave me all this crap. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take whatever I want. And so, yeah. So I took that Vicodin, put me on a cloud. Um, and yeah, I was just, I guess, and I guess I was never meant to be a drinker. You know, I just don't like being out of it and out of it in the sense where you don't, you're, you can't like palpably grasp your, your, uh, your id like Marty. Like I, you know, I can feel I'm Marty still, you know, with, with pills up until that point. Yeah. I'd be like, you know, I'd be, uh, I'd be down and, you know, but I could still, I was still Marty in my head. I could still, you know, whereas when you drink, I mean, you kind of just lose that inhibition of if, who you are and you're just kind of wild and wacky. I guess I was always kind of, uh, you know, bred or not bred, but, you know, just positioned to be that, that kind of person. So. Take responsibility for your life. Achieve fulfillment with recovery. Check out responsiblerecovery.net.